Welcome. Today's topic is um, food security, and we have um, two fabulous experts to talk about that. One is going to focus more on national issues and the other on international issues. Um, I've been getting some great um, ideas for final projects. Um, uh, keep them coming. And I, the rubric will be posted um, tomorrow or Wednesday. So we'll have a rubric for you then on um, Blackboard. Um, but I've, actually, the quality of the projects has been fabulous. And Jose has also really um, loved them. So um, anything that you want to go over with me, um, please send them in. So I'm delighted to introduce Rear Admiral James Bennett, Barnett. Um, he is a member of Mission Readiness. Um, and you're going to hear about it. It's, a, it's a, actually um, a fabulous program. Um, it's a nonpartisan national security organization, which is led by more than 300 retired generals and admirals calling for smart investments in America's children. Um, he's a partner in the law firm, Venable, where he serves as a co-chair of its telecommunications group. Um, he came also from the FCC. He spent three years at the FCC, um, but um, um, joined the Navy um, in 1976. Um, he served in uh, the Gulf and then was recalled in 1990 for um, Operation Desert, Seal, Desert, Shore, uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Um, he is now going to talk to us about mission readiness and um, in particular about a, uh, a topic that has come up often on this co in this course and will continue to come up, um, and uh, especially next week, and that is obesity and its impact on the military. Thanks, uh, Paula, and uh, thank you for being here and have the opportunity to, to speak with you today. Uh, and uh, I appreciate that uh, Chef Andreas would have uh, such a course as this. I, as she mentioned, I'm in a law firm now. My law firm is uh, located equidistant from uh, Zatinia and Haleo, so it's, uh, it's really good for us right there in downtown uh, D.C. Uh, hopefully you picked up one of the little flyers, a couple of the flyers that we had. It's uh, just for fun. You're actually not going to be tested on this, uh, on this uh, information, by me at least. There may be others that uh, test you on it. Um, but you might want to just kind of keep it handy uh, as we go through. Uh, and you may have a couple of questions of your own, uh, one of which may be you're probably wondering why some old retired admiral is here to talk to you about food. Uh, and, and the second question uh, may be that uh, what, what is this organization uh, that, uh, that I represent? And so uh, just a little bit about uh, me first. As, as Paula mentioned, retired admiral. Uh, I've kind of had an eclectic career. I do have a law degree. I practice in downtown uh, D.C. with a firm called Venable, and it's kind of cyber security. It has nothing to do with food whatsoever. Uh, but uh, I, I, the, the thick accent comes from Mississippi. I have a theory, a food theory about that. Years and years of eating grits, I think, makes people talk slow like this. Um, but uh, in the Navy, one of the things that I did was I got to be the director of Naval Education and Training, and a component of that was training our people uh, to do the jobs that they do. And that, that also looks at, at things like physical fitness and nutrition. So it's something that's been uh, interesting to, to me for a, a long time. Now, the organization itself uh, is <clears throat> uh, comprised of about 350 uh, now, and it's growing, uh, retired admirals and generals. Uh, it's a, we consider ourselves a national security organization. Uh, it, it is called Mission Readiness for uh, a good purpose. It's not uh, not for profit. Uh, it is it advocates for programs and policies and investments in young people so that the next generation can grow up to be citizen ready. Uh, we want to ensure that we have enough uh, young people to, that are qualified to serve their country uh, in, and make sure that we maintain the strength of the all-volunteer force. Uh, but let me tell you some of the things that we don't do. Uh, we don't take any government money. Uh, we don't run any government programs, uh, and we don't really work with military recruiters uh, to get teenagers to join the armed forces. That's not, not our purpose at all, and uh, if anybody you want to talk about joining the military, I'd be glad to, but uh, it, it's, not, it's not what Mission Readiness is about. We really just want kids to be successful in whatever path they choose, which would include a military option if, if they would like to do that, but it's just good for, for society if uh, Americans grow up well-educated, healthy, and law-abiding. So in 2009, the small group that I mentioned 
uh, organized a, res a response to a very stark uh, statistic reported by the Department of uh, Defense. So these are Pentagon numbers. 75% of all 17 to 24 year olds are currently ineligible to serve in the military. If three quarters of folks that may be around your age uh, show up, they're not gonna be able to get in. Um, they'd be turned away. Now you think about how hard it was for you to get into George Washington University alone. I know that the, the requirements are very high for that. Um, you can think about this other, if you take 75 people in 75% uh, of the, the population, just say you're not gonna uh, be able to do this anyway. So uh, can anybody just venture a guess at, at what some of the reasons why 75% are not able to get into the military? Any guess? Not physically fit. Not physically fit would be one of them. Other, other reasons? Medical conditions. Medical conditions is another reason. Other ones? Criminal records. Criminal records is another reason. Any other ones? Okay, so that's those. That's right. So the educational attainment would, would be uh, another reason. So you've all done well on that. So um, nationwide, uh, a quarter of all 17 to 24 year olds don't graduate on time. So the graduation rates is, is important in the military right now. And even among those who do graduate in time, another quarter of those uh, can't pass the military entrance exam or ASVAB. So educational component is a, a significant portion. And by the way, I might add, um, whatever stereotypes might exist in the movies and other places uh, about uh, service in the military, it's, it's not the World War II image of grab a gun and go anymore. The military has complex weapons uh, platforms, sensors of all sort of stuff, uh, nuclear submarines and all sorts of uh, different type of radar, satellites and things like that. We need not just people who are physically fit, but who are mentally fit. So education, uh, an educational baseline is an important thing for all ranks and, and, uh, and ratings. The other thing is, is about two in 10 uh, have had some type of criminal record, either a very serious uh, misdemeanor or a felony in the record that keeps them from joining. And then once again, that's a that's a, a thing from times past. It used to be, as a matter of fact, even in my high school class, there was a guy that got into trouble and the judge gave him a, the opportunity. So well, you can either go to jail or you can go to the military. That's gone now. That, that simply does not happen. Uh, and then of increasing importance to the military and concern uh, is the third major reason that some of you mentioned, and that is obesity. Um, we're now seeing the signs of really a childhood obesity epidemic. Uh, it's the uh, the rate has tripled since 1980, uh, and it's begun to affect the, the military. Obesity now is the leading medical disqualifier. So you mentioned that there are, there are medical reasons, but of, all the, of those medical reasons, obesity is the greatest one. Uh, a full quarter of the 18 to 24-year-olds are too heavy to serve in uniform. And, and to give you an idea, so a quarter of that age demographic can't serve because of obesity. To give you an idea of what the next one is, is only 4% of that population, and that's for asthma. So this is a major problem, and the trend lines run in the wrong direction. Um, so I wanna, I wanna take you through time for just a second. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make some general assumptions about the, 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 the median age of this audience. I'm gonna say a lot of you were probably born in the, the early 90s or mid 90s or something like that, but if you, didn't want, if you weren't, I'm gonna show you basically things that started happening before your lifetime but, uh, but during it as well. So let's take a look at what has happened to the collective waistline of our nation. All right, so this is uh, 1985. The white uh, indicates uh, not enough data. They really don't have the data for that, so really only pay attention to it. And just so you can, you may not be able to read this very well, but the light blue is less than 10% of the population, and the darker blue is 10% is to 14% of the population, that actually has a uh, body mass index uh, equal to or greater than 30, or you can roughly say about 30, 30 pounds overweight for a 5'4 uh, uh, person. So 1985. 1986, maybe we have more data, so let's, let's just, we'll say. 1987, 1988, 1990, and now we've got 1990, let's go into 1991. We have to come up with a new color. Why do we have to come up with a new color? 
because now we got people, 15 to 19 percent of the population uh, that uh, is, is over uh, that 30 percent body mass index. Uh, and and uh, of course, my home state of Mississippi stands out there as one of the leaders in that. Uh, all right, I'm going to take it through in, in rapid succession to give you the effect of it. 92, 93, 94, 95. Anything going on? Picking up any trends here? 96, 97. Oh, we have to come up with a new color. Mississippi once again jumps out. By the way, if you go to get gasoline in, in Mississippi anywhere, just about any service station you stop at, you can get uh, fried chicken and Jojo potatoes. Anybody know what Jojo potatoes are? They're battered and fried. So, I mean, everything, uh, uh, there's a reason for some of this. So now we've got basically 20, the, the yellow now, the gold, is equal to or greater than 20% of the, the population ha has a body mass index uh, of uh, uh, equal to or greater than 30. Uh, significantly overweight. 98, 99, 2000. Okay, so, so now we, we've seen basically we got all the data in up to 1990. Now it's going to, to 2000. Let's take the progression again. Oh, there's a new color. New color. Now greater than 25% of the population uh, has that, that is overweight. 2002, we have some additions. People are competing with Mississippi now. Um, 2003, 2004, 2005, new colors. Once again, uh, we're, we're seeing significant overweight. 2006, more new colors. 2007, 2008, we have a serious problem in the country. This, this affects a lot more than just the military, but it definitely affects, uh, affects the military. 2010, so now you've seen, in essence, I'm gonna call it good data from, uh, on two decennials. We had uh, 1990, 2000, 2010. Uh, and you can see where the, where the trend lines are on that. And this gives you an overall depiction of kind of what, what's happened uh, over these last uh, 20 years. All right, <clears throat> as a result, Military service is really out of reach for a million Americans. So the, the course you're taking is, the, in essence, the, uh, the effect of food on, on, on civilization. And I just want one aside on this. Right after World War II, uh, millions of people all of a sudden had all these benefits. Veterans Administration for health, for housing, for education. And there's some sociologists who really point to those post uh, World War II um, benefits as being part of the rise of the middle class, kind of the happy days of the 1950s uh, and, and the boom that occurred right then. Well, now we're talking about the sociological effects of clearly 75% of the people not being eligible for those types of things. And in essence, the ability, the, the social mobility, the economic mobility to move up by serving your nation in the military four years and then getting out and having those benefits. It has a significant sociological impact. The shrinking pool of eligible recruits really is a threat to our national security, and we're, we're troubled uh, by the likely, uh, likely impact that this will have on the military preparedness of the future. And we do tend to think of our, our military in terms of, in terms of ships and airplanes and weapons uh, platforms, but really the most important part of the military and the most expensive part of the military, so clearly 60% of the military budget goes for people. Uh, and since uh, 2005, the military has turned away almost 50,000 otherwise qualified recruits uh, because of uh, being overweight. All right. <clears throat> Obesity is not just a problem uh, for potential recruits. It's obviously a problem where it's taken from society. We're, we're subjected to all this stuff. And I would, I would say that uh, I would want to emphasize that we have a very fit military, but it does have its problems. Uh, and the data shows that obesity impacts those who have already enlisted, somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 um, enlisted members are forced to leave each year during their first term of enlistment uh, because of their weight. 
And in 2008, one study showed that about 4,555 members were discharged for failure uh, to meet height and weight standards. So they either needed to reduce their the waistline or they needed to get taller. Uh, of course, the Pentagon um, has to replace these folks. And it cost about 50000 to recruit and train the replacements. So if you do the math on that, that's about $183 million just because of weight. Uh, beyond its effect on recruitment and retention, obesity opposes a greater financial burden on the military. So in addition to the, the cost of replacing these people, the DOD estimates that about $1.1 billion is spent on the medical expenses of providing for our, our military members and their dependents. And there's one thing I'd like for you to know about the, the military budget. It's not like the Pentagon is handed, well, here's the money for your weapons, and here is the money, separate money, for your me medical uh, concerns. When we spend money on medical benefits for our military, that takes away from military readiness, from military weapons, from whatever we've decided that we need uh, for our own preparedness and defense, that, that takes out. And the trend lines are that we literally are going to eat ourselves out of national security as the years go on. We've got to get it under control. All right. <clears throat> so, obesity is hurting us on the battlefield as well. Uh, troops in Afghanistan are, are already lugging around 40 to 70 pounds of packs. Um, it, it may be that people's sedentary lifestyle before getting into the military uh, is affecting them, but because of that, or because it's so rough in the field, and it is, uh, the fact of the matter is we're sh seeing more and more uh, stress fractures and, and, uh, and sprains, and it's an alarming rate of what we're seeing. The Deputy uh, Surgeon General for the Army uh, recently said that muscular skeletal injuries are the leading cause of medical non-ready soldiers. Uh, and what's really uh, scary, too, is that we're, we're seeing the prevalence of a, an especially nasty stress, fa stress fracture, I never could say it, stress fracture, uh, that often goes unnoticed at first, uh, and it, it's called a femoral neck injury. It's not a neck injury, it's a femoral uh, neck injury, uh, and it, it's, it's, it happens when, the, the, in essence, the tip of the, uh, the pelvis cracks. Uh, in one of the main uh, boot camps for the Army, Fort Jackson, they average thousands of these injuries per year, and it costs about $100,000 to $300,000 uh, to actually get that fixed, so it's, it's of concern. Um, this citation is a little bit old, uh, but soldiers, uh, the 71% uh, percent are more likely to be evacuated because of this type of uh, work. So we're not necessarily as fit, where because of our nutrition is not as good, we're not as physically fit uh, as you want to. By the way, if you're following along in your little page, uh, that's answer number three. <clears throat> so the, the Department of Defense has already uh, identified uh, obesity, in particular childhood obesity, as a major problem for the military. It's taking steps to remedy these problems, uh, kind of the can-do attitude. In August of last year, they formed a working group uh, in DOD, uh, and among other uh, areas, the working group is, is looking at changing uh, the, the military base uh, schools and their menus in the schools, analyzing what cha changes can be made to the general environment so that uh, the children can become more physically active. Uh, military officials are creating standardized menus for the child development centers to ensure that they're meeting children's uh, nutritional needs. It's looking at healthy choices in vending machines and snack counters, schools, dining facilities, clubs, any of the on-base locations uh, that offer food. And their efforts are, are especially important because half of the youth in the military families are likely to consider military service as uh, their career. Uh, but we know obesity is not just the military's problem. I think all of us could, would agree that obesity is one of society's most vexing uh, problems. And it, it starts with the individual. Uh, for kids, instilling proper diet and uh, exercise habits starts at home with sound pa parenting. Uh, and, and it's hard uh, to determine the causes of the epidemic uh, until you factor in a lot of things. And there's really no silver bullet. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, nutrition experts at the Institutes of Medicine have said that the school environment should be a focal point for an all-out effort to confront the crisis, especially because kids consume up to half of their daily calories at school. So if you've got them concentrated there, you know that's where they're taking the calories. 
why wouldn't you at least look there at, at making a major improvement? And the interest in, in, uh, in the military in childhood nutrition is not new. Uh, actually, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you went to schools where there was a school lunch program. School lunch program came about because of the military. Uh, and the reason is, is that during World War II, uh, people were coming into the, to, you know, showing up for the draft, actually, some people were trying to join. And what happened was, is that a lot of them were undernourished. Why were they undernourished? Well, the nation had just gone through a depression and a dust bowl and a lot of other things like that. And so the military actually went to Congress and said, this was a problem. So they only rejected about 16% of the people who showed up. But among those, 40 to 60% of it was because they were undernourished. And, and what they asked for resulted in the School Lunch Act of 1947. In other words, nutrition for children was a national security problem. And the same is true now. It's just that it's not undernourishment that is the problem. So uh, this issue became an important part of the conversation, um, and uh, it is now as well. So <clears throat> in 2010, the nutrition bill uh, was up for authorization in my organization, Mission Readiness. And by the way, you, you may meet uh, Mike Jane, who's in the audience, who helped uh, do a lot of the research for this. Uh, we joined with other key allies uh, to, to, in essence, try to get secure passage for the new standards, new scientifically-based standards uh, for school lunch and breakfast programs, as well as the food that's sold in vending machines and the a la carte line, which is called competitive schools, uh, competitive uh, food, and we'll talk about this in a little while. We mobilized and got the Healthy Hunger Free uh, Kids Act passed. Uh, we published a report that was called Too Fat to Fight that talked about this. We climbed Capitol Hill. It was a bipartisan effort. We, we met with uh, uh, former Senator Richard Luger, who is a Republican, uh, Democratic Agriculture Secretary uh, Tom Vilsack. We reached a, an audience of about 140 million people. Uh, met with the majority leader in the Senate and, and the House Speaker and every other key uh, uh, lawmaker that we could that would listen. And, uh, and it really was a bipartisan effort that uh, got this passed. And really, uh, one of the main things that was cited was the national security concerns for it. I will also have to say that it was, for me personally, one of the thrilling days when uh, I got to meet Michelle Obama uh, as uh, I sat in the, uh, the signing ceremony. I was actually, I didn't take this picture, but I was uh, sitting kind of right there. And Michelle Obama actually thanked Mission Readiness for helping to pass this bill based on national security concerns. The school lunch and breakfast programs uh, took effect this fall. And uh, kids across the school are already getting healthier fare, more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. But, uh, Although Congress gave the Department of Agriculture the authority to update these new scientifically based standards for school lunches and breakfasts on the really good, good nutritional science, it wasn't long before the lobbyists uh, got to the lawmakers and, and a year after it was passed in a completely unrelated bill, Congress slipped in some loopholes including they, they blew off the top of uh, the, the cap on what, what potatoes uh, could be. So, you know, basically the potato lobby said you can't do this, this with the kids need their tater tots. Um, and so the other thing that they did, and the notorious example that you see here, was the decision to classify tomato paste on pizza as a vegetable. Um, so it was too uh, brazen to escape public uh, ridicule, and on the paper that we hand out there's another cartoon about this. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, even though it was ridiculed, the loophole stands. It's still in there. And so uh, pizza is, is declared a vegetable uh, for nutritional standards now. Uh, nevertheless, even with these loopholes, I, I would want to state unequivocally that this is an improvement in the diets of school children. The work's not done. Uh, we also have to make sure that uh, schools have the proper support uh, to meet nutritional standards. And uh, let me give you an example of some of this. This, this is a, a, an oven that is actually in use in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, a lot of schools do not have the equipment that they need. We heard, also heard of one uh, school in, in uh, Kentucky that only had deep fat fryers. They didn't have ovens. Uh, it's, it's a major concern. We need to do uh, something to be able to make sure in addition to the standards 
and a little bit extra money to make sure that the schools can raise the standards with the quality of their food. We also need to make sure that they've got the equipment and the training. So uh, one, uh, one school worker, and I think this was in Kentucky as well, had fresh zucchinis come in the door. Well, they'd never had fresh fr uh, zucchini. They didn't know what to do with them. Uh, and, but I will say that they did come up with something. They came up with zucchini muffins. So that's, uh, I, I think that's a good, uh, good response. Now, as, the, as we said, competitive foods is, is of concern. The, the nation's taken great steps toward uh, setting new standards. We need to finish the job and make sure that the nutritional standards are set for vending machines and for a la carte cafeteria lines. So this is, the a la carte concept is, is you got all this nice bro broiled fish and good vegetables, but then you can also separately buy the hamburger and the french fried onion rings uh, instead of the eating the healthy food. We came out with a new report. It's called Still Too Fat to Fight, and it shows that schools are selling nearly 400 billion empty calories of junk food every year. Now that's equivalent of two billion candy bars the combined weight of which is about 90,000 tons, which is more than the aircraft carrier that you see on, on the right here. Uh, put into end these candy bars would wrap around the earth more than six times. And too many schools have uh, these, these vending machines and other venues where they can still and routinely buy Cokes, candies, chips, cookies, and really sugar-sweetened fruit uh, or sports drinks. All of this junk food is undermining those efforts, those good efforts to reduce uh, junk food. Uh, so uh, this spring, the USDA will come out with its second step of standards, finalizing uh, the, qu the quality standards for snack foods and vending machines and a la carte lines. What, what could possibly go wrong? Well, the same thing went wrong before. We have to m carefully maintain and make sure that lobbies don't open up uh, loopholes we can't really afford another uh, replay of the Pizzagate. Um, now, we've been talking about the school environment um, with, and conf confronting the obesity epidemic. Uh, just, just by a show of hands, if you could, how many of you took physical education, PE in high school? Okay. How many took PE in high school your senior year? Fewer, fewer hands, okay. So really, it, it takes years, not months. Uh, to, to build a, a strong, healthy body and the foundation of good fitness really is laid in childhood and young adulthood. Uh, but in the midst of this obesity crisis, most students still do not have adequate levels of physical activity. And I was shocked to learn that really less than 20% of schools nationwide currently provide opportunities to engage in physical activity before, during, and after school. Um, the, the fact that 80% uh, of high school seniors don't get it is of, of concern. So you've heard a little bit about uh, mission readiness now. Uh, I'd like to, to hear from you about what you think we might be able to do from a state, local, and federal uh, activity. Just quick answers and what you might think we might be able to do to turn this around. Uh, and, and then we'll finish up and I'll turn it over uh, to our next uh, speaker, Mr. Schreier, who's gonna talk about kind of the other end of the problem, uh, the lack of food. What, what can we do about such an epidemic like this? Yes, ma'am. Well, in the military, I believe that one of the problems is the MRE, because I know that when we get MREs in the field for Army ROTC, then it's, I think, 6,000 calories if you eat the entire meal, and most of it is, I mean, there's no fiber in it. It's all starch, and so if you were to, I guess, change the way that MREs are considered, you know, and packaged and the way that they're given to the troops, I think that that could make a big difference. Like uh, so, so I, I don't know if everybody could hear that. So you actually change MREs, and, and the, the fact is that, that there are many, many calories. I don't know if it's 6,000. If you eat that, the, the plastic wrapper on the outside, that's 6,000. But, uh, uh, but you're actually right. So MREs are, are not actually designed um, to do anything more than sustain people who are too far away. But, but, but I would want to refocus you. So there might be ways to make more healthy food for people who are not going to be able to get to a field kitchen or, and have a little bit healthier food. But we really need to back it up. I mean, you're, you're talking about people in the military. And while I did mention that, the thing I'm concerned about is the years uh, of people coming up to where they're actually two. So, I mean, what can we do even before they get inside the military? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think, I, I remember reading some of the issue of food deserts. There are tons of like, towns that 
around in communities that um, are not within driving or walking distance of fresh produce and like, major markets? That's right. The, the, the whole concept of food deserts, where you have places where people don't may have good transportation, they can only go to the local store. The local store is kind of a, you know, well, I don't want to name any, uh, it's a convenience store, convenience store type foods that may not be have the fresh, fresh fruits and things like that. I think you're exactly right. Yes, ma'am. That's right. So may, uh, choice would be Im important, maybe. One, one thing that I think goes right along with what you're talking about is that, you know, heretofore we've thought of, oh, I'm going to leave the classroom now and I'm going to go down to the lunchroom. What if the lunchroom becomes a classroom? What if we're actually teaching the nutritional facts uh, that, that kids say? Kids are hungry for, for food. They're also hungry for the information that goes with food. And I do think we can control uh, the access to um, sugary drinks, uh, sodas, and things like that. And then not, not necessarily in a, in a Mayor Bloomberg, uh, you're, you can't drink anything over uh, 17 ounces is not good, 16, okay. Uh, but I mean, to be able to limit that and then also teach it, I think, is very important. One more? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, in sort of going off teaching the children, you could teach the parents as well so that when the kids are outside of the school, the parents will also be able to provide them good food. I, I think that's a great, great thing because Calories taken in at school is only half the problem, right? Uh, and one of the things that we found in the military is we could provide all sorts of information and even incentive to our military members, but they still go home at night. And so that information has to be transferred at home. The same is true at schools. And there does need to be a community involvement in that to make sure that they have the information and the choices. So these are great ideas, and I appreciate you putting them in there. I'd like to close with what mission readiness will be focused on in the, in the coming months. For starters, we're going to remain on guard, as I mentioned, uh, for any attempts uh, by Congress to weaken the standards. Uh, there have been some complaints already, mostly from kids who aren't really thrilled uh, about being asked to uh, eat more vegetables. But in all seriousness, we likely are, are going to be fine-tuning the new standards, and, and that's a process that's going to be ongoing. It's not, it's not really time to, to roll these back. Uh, we need to make sure that our schools and cafeteria workers are set up for success with the training that they need and the equipment uh, that can actually make healthy food. And the fourth thing is, it should be a, uh, a no-brainer, we have to get physical education back in school. Uh, we've gone just a little bit too far, and, and part of it's budget cut. It's easy to cut physical education programs, just like it's easy to cut music and some other things that are really, I think, necessary. Uh, but for this, it's a national security uh, question, and it's a health question to get PE back in our schools. And really, one way that we can do that, because that's all state-controlled, right? It's school districts. The federal government can't do that. But simply getting some data, getting schools to report how much PE students get would actually provide researchers with some very in important policy tools for doing this. Beyond schools, we're uh, working to make healthy food more affordable, uh, we've asked Congress to include incentives in the upcoming bill that would allow those receiving the SNAP benefits, used to be called the food, food stamps, uh, more purchasing power when they, they make healthy choices. Uh, since 1960, the proportion of kids who walk or bike to school has dropped from 4 in 10 to 1 in 10, and one large reason for that is environmental. Communities across the country need the infrastructure improvements uh, to make sure that people feel safe and, and uh, or have easy access to walk or bike to school, and that's transportation funding. So once again, thanks so much for, for having me. I'm going to uh, hold off any time on questions and, and turn it over to our, our next speaker, who I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing. But thank you so much for the opportunity to come and, and talk with you today and for your interest in how food uh, affects our civilization. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. That map was really quite dramatic and shocking, actually, as it uh, changed colors over the years. Um, delighted to have Jonathan Schreck um, talk to you next. He is the Acting Special Representative for Global Food Security um, at, uh, the US, um, at, at the State Department. Um, he um, uh, oversees, uh, um, he's responsible for coordinating all aspects of U.S. diplomacy related to food security and nutrition, 
including in support of Feed the Future, the US government's global hunger and food security initiative. Um, I really like actually how this week's topic is gonna tie in really nicely with next week's topic. You'll see a lot of um, things coming together. Um, he has served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary and Acting Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs at the US Department of Energy um, and has also um, uh, traveled um, and did service at the US Embassy in Beijing. He worked with USAID there to establish a developmental assistance program for Tibetan communities in China. Um, I was really impressed to see that he speaks Mandarin, Chinese, Arabic, French, and Spanish. But I think today will be in English. <laughs> I'm, hope, I'm hoping so. Okay. Well, good afternoon. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm just picking up on, uh, on uh, uh, the, the previous presentation. Um, during uh, my time at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, one time I went to uh, meet with some of my colleagues in the defense attaché's office, the U.S. military representatives that, that work at the embassy. And I uh, walked in and, and uh, one of them had his arms wrapped around the other one. And I wasn't sure what I'd exactly walked in on, um, but it turned out he was measuring uh, waist size for the, uh, the physical fitness report that had to be sent back in order to get this person promoted. Um, so the military really does take seriously that, that, that attention to fitness, even for desk jockeys at, at uh, based at embassies. So uh, again, I'm really glad to be here uh, to talk to you about global food security. This is the other end of the, the problem, as, as was just mentioned. Uh, th this is the problem of people who generally don't have enough to eat. Uh, to start us off, let's uh, warm up with a couple of quotes. Okay, this quote uh, is from Norman Borlaug. Who's, uh, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in, in 1971 for his work on agricultural technologies that helped uh, feed hundreds of millions of people over time. Um, the estimates have ranged as high as a billion people whose lives were saved because of the agricultural technology innovations that Borlaug uh, pioneered, which included uh, improved wheat varieties in Mexico that were later exported to, to India and China um, and, and really transformed their food systems. Now I'd like to bring you another quote. This one uh, comes from someone who I think is a, a hero in college campuses everywhere. This is uh, the inventor of ramen noodles, um, who recognized uh, during his time in uh, Japan in the, uh, in the 60s, uh, seeing food lines lined up outside of uh, the, the limited uh, um, shops and restaurants as, as Japan was recovering still from, from uh, the post-war uh, um, economic problems that it had after World War II. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a few things. First of all, just the, the challenge of global food security, what it is that we're facing. Um, one of the major global efforts to, to address that problem called the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative, named after the city in Italy where it was announced. Uh, then uh, talk a bit more about the U.S. government's uh, Feed the Future initiative, which is our presidential initiative aimed at working down the problem of hunger and poverty and undernutrition, and a little bit more about uh, the role of the State Department, which is just down the street. Um, so uh, the challenge we face is that there are somewhere close to 870 million people today who go to bed hungry every night. That's about one in eight of your fellow citizens on this planet. 98% of those are not here in Washington. They are somewhere in the developing world. Uh, and, uh, and that population is going to grow if we don't do something about it, because global population is growing rapidly. We expect the population to exceed 9 billion people by, by 2050. Uh, that will require at least a 60% increase in global food production to feed the people who are hungry today plus the others who are going to join us on this planet in the decades to come. Uh, the, um, the world is going to have to do that with uh, uh, constraints on the, supply, the availability of, of land that can be farmed, uh, reduced availability of water, and a changing climate that affects, it, uh, affects food production in various ways. In some places, it's, uh, it's getting drier. In other places, sea levels are rising, which means it's wetter. Um, or, or subject to uh, um, uh, extreme weather events. 
uh, or increased salinity, salt in the soil, which, which obviously affects the, the ability to grow things. Well, people have been uh, increasingly recognizing the problem of global food security, and it really came to a head uh, just a few years ago. In 2007, 2008, there were food price increases, uh, sudden increases that led to riots in dozens of countries around the world. And that really refocused attention of world leaders who came together on the margins of a G8 summit, a group of eight summit in L'Aquila, Italy in 2009. And uh, really, uh, um, with the US um, uh, leading the charge, we launched something called the L'Aquila Food, uh, the, the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative, um, known by its initials AFSI, A-F-S-I, which stands for, you know, the A is in L'Aquila, and then the rest is Food Security Initiative. And that really uh, took, us, uh, took advantage of the learning that we've had over, the, over recent years on how to do development better. And that means uh, things like not just giving out money to whatever country seems needy, but really looking to the countries that are in need to take charge of their own future, to develop their own plans for their agricultural development and their food security, um, and really own the, the, their piece of the problem. That is, their piece of solving the problem. And that's the country ownership piece. Uh, there's also an element of strategic coordination, which gets us away from the old way of doing business, which was everyone who wanted to help, every organization, every donor, every international institution that wanted to help went in with its own plan, full speed ahead. We need to work together. We need to coordinate our efforts. We also need to make sure we're working the problem no matter how it arises. So there are problems that you see uh, often in, in, in the news of refugee camps. There was just a 60 minutes item about the, the lost boys of, of Sudan. Um, who uh, ended up spending uh, uh, years in refugee camps before being moved to the United States. Those people are in acute need. They need food now. They need food that you can put in their hands, that they can put in their mouths. Um, but uh, we also need to address the root causes of hunger, and that means uh, um, development. It means uh, uh, in improving the, the um, economies of the countries uh, that, that uh, suffer from hunger. Um, and and uh, uh, research has demonstrated that one of the best ways to do that is to invest in agriculture. That is to help the agricultural sector grow, which obviously grows more food, um, but it also grows the economy so that people can buy the food that they need. So we're working on both ends of the problem, the immediate needs, the acute hunger, and the chronic hunger. We're also uh, working on making sure that we're taking full advantage of all the international organizations that uh, US tax dollars and, and donors around the world support through the, the UN agencies, uh, like the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Bank, uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute, which is up the street in Washington, DC, and so on. And we also need to um, make, uh, make good on our commitments to support uh, solutions to the problem. For the U.S., um, we, we, President Obama launched Feed the Future, which is the U.S. government's uh, uh, global food security uh, initiative. Feed the Future is aimed at sustainably addressing the, the challenge of, of hunger, poverty, and undernutrition with a focus on smallholder farmers, especially women. And to do that, we, we are focused on, first of all, accelerating inclusive agriculture sector growth that means raising rural household incomes. And th again, this gets back to the idea that if you help farmers earn more, they'll be able to uh, buy the food they need if they're not growing it themselves. And, and uh, uh, um, one of the, the uh, most important parts of this is making sure that they're really getting a, a fully nutritional food basket in the home. And so if they're growing maize, they need to buy some additional food. They can't just subsist on maize and have a healthy diet. Um, and, uh, and so it's really making sure that people are able to, to address their full nutritional needs. And I'll get back to some of the reasons why that nutrition piece is so important in just a moment. Feed the Future also takes the approach that we, we need to focus our efforts. Again, we, we don't just uh, um, give uh, development assistance to every country that is in need. We want to work with countries that, that are ready for partnership, that are ready to work with us. And through a, a, an analytical effort, we identified 19 countries that, that uh, we, we thought would make good partners 
And over time, we developed uh, strategies uh, with them. First of all, they developed their own strategies for addressing their food security needs. Um, and then we worked on top of that to develop US assistance plans, which, which were developed over a five-year period. So you can see that uh, the bulk of these countries are, are concentrated in Africa. There, there are 12 of the 19 in Africa. There are three in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and four in different parts of Asia. And do we have any geography majors here uh, who could help identify countries? Um, so uh, basically, in, in close to home here, we've got Haiti, Honduras, and Guatemala. Um, I, I won't list all of the 12 in Africa, but we can do that during questions and answers, if you like. And then off in Asia, we've got Tajikistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and uh, Cambodia. Um, so, uh, um, but what, what we've got is a mix of countries that are ready for change. And so we identified these countries by looking to see whether they were hungry. We, we looked at a, a global hunger index produced by the, the International Food Policy Research Institute that I mentioned. Um, we looked at uh, their, um, th their readiness to, to, do, to, to either, the, the, either they already had a national agricultural development strategy or they were uh, ready to produce one, maybe with some assistance for us. Um, they, they, uh, and through that, they demonstrated potential for change. Um, you know, it, it, again, if a country uh, uh, like, say, South Sudan, which at the time we were we were identifying these countries wasn't even a country yet, um, but as it, as it was emerging into independence, it wasn't really ready to launch a, a national effort um, to address food security in a in a lasting way. They were still identifying ministers, identifying ministry staff, and so on. Ministers meaning government officials who had ministries. Um, and, uh, um, and so we, had, we needed countries that were ready for, for, for change. Um, we also looked at uh, um, whether they were embedded in a regional system that could, could help support their agriculture growth. And then we looked at resource availability. Was the government of that country putting money into agricultural development and improved nutrition? Were we ready? Did we have the right kind of people on the ground in that country, or were we prepared to put US agricultural development specialists, nutrition experts, and so on into our AID missions, our, our development assistance missions in that country? And were we prepared to put budgetary resources to that over time? Um, so we're, we're, we're doing things differently with Feed the Future. We're, we're helping countries to pursue the priorities that they've developed for themselves. We're also taking a whole of government approach. That means that it's not just about one agency going in, again, sort of like what I was describing with different donors each doing their own thing. Um, we're, we're trying to also um, make sure that we know what all the different government agencies are doing that might contribute to solutions to the problem and make sure that we're coordinating those efforts. And so there are, there are nine agencies that uh, routinely are part of the Feed the Future effort, but there are more besides that, that sometimes uh, uh, get involved. We're also uh, devoted to an evidence-based approach. That means we're trying to find solutions that work, that are proven to work, proven with data. And that means we also have to track our own impacts. We have to uh, uh, collect data on what we're doing, how many farmers we're reaching, how many of them are actually adopting the new technologies that we're introducing, how many uh, children and, and uh, uh, lactating mothers are we reaching with nutrition interventions to help uh, improve nutrition and so on. So we publish reports, uh, some of which I, I think were um, made available to you in advance, um, that demonstrate the impacts that we're having over time. We also know that we can't do it alone. I mentioned the idea of coordinating among donors and with international organizations. but We also need to take a multi-sectoral approach. And what that means is, uh, the, 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 the U.S. development agencies and, uh, and other U.S. agencies are partnering with private corporations that are ready to help, with uh, civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations that are ready to help. And, uh, and, and so this has led to some important new partnerships throughout, uh, throughout the countries where we're working. One uh, area where we've really seen some, some uh, dramatic results in this was announced at last year's G8 summit, which was held here in, uh, actually in Camp David, Maryland, with an event the day before here in Washington, D.C. Um, so the U.S. hosted the group of eight last year, and President Obama announced something called the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. And this new alliance is focused on Africa, and it's focused on 
um, uh, collectively working together to lift 50 million people out of poverty over 10 years. To do that uh, primarily by helping accelerate agriculture sector growth and to do that um, by adding a new piece to the, the, the mix of solutions which is really driving private sector activity and investment in the sector. And that means domestic private sector investment from the African countries involved and regional and international investment into African agriculture. And to, to make this happen, we've got a, a very uh, um, uh, exciting three-way partnership. The African governments are committing to policy reforms and to, uh, to, to uh, mobilizing public funding, their budgets, their national budgets, to promote investment in agriculture. Donor governments, like the US government, are committing to align our assistance behind the national priorities of the African countries involved and to help them uh, achieve their policy reform agendas. And then uh, private sector partners have stepped forward. And so we've got uh, now uh, as many as 60 companies from around the world, some in Africa, some uh, from, from the US or Europe or Japan, that have stepped forward with investment commitments. They've said, we're going to invest in the seed sector in Tanzania to help uh, introduce improved seed varieties that can improve agricultural productivity, grow more maize, grow more uh, millet or, or whatever. Uh, or uh, we are going to invest in improved uh, telecommunications infrastructure to help get information to farmers so that they can find out the best prices for their produce um, and, uh, and get market information or get uh, agricultural extension information about how to improve their productivity and so on. So it's a very exciting uh, mix of, 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 uh, of African governments, international actors like the US, and private sector partners involved in this partnership. The, um, uh, so, so, uh, so that's the new alliance. We're also, uh, I mentioned I would get back to the nutrition piece. We're also uh, very actively involved in promoting nutrition through Feed the Future and through our support for something called the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, which was launched by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon at an event that also featured uh, our former Secretary of State, then Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. And the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement really focuses on this undernutrition piece. Um, this, uh, I believe that's a little girl in the picture, um, is uh, undoubtedly stunted, which means she's short for her age. Um, and uh, um, she's probably suffering from uh, um, permanent uh, deficits in stature, for one thing, but also uh, probably in cognitive development. These are irreversible kinds of changes. And they come about, um, medical research has demonstrated, when uh, undernutrition strikes, especially in the period from the start of pregnancy through a child's second birthday. That's the period with the highest impact on, on a person's lifelong development. So when you don't get enough uh, nutrition then, um, you're less able to contribute to uh, your, your family's livelihood, your, your community's development, and your, your uh, country's uh, economic growth. And so uh, the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement is working with dozens of countries around the world to uh, help them uh, uh, address nutrition in the context of their uh, development efforts, their efforts to grow their economies. <clears throat> and we, we uh, expect that this will uh, lead to the, the uh, impacts listed on the slide, which I won't read out to you, um, but it's a crucially important effort. Uh, we've launched, uh, the US has launched something called the Thousand Days Partnership um, to help uh, drive attention to uh, this, this critical development window. Over at the State Department, uh, just a few blocks away, we're, we're focused on a few pieces of the, the uh, global food security effort. We're, uh, we're um, leading the work in developing strategic partnerships with countries that have just recently gone through their own extraordinary agriculture uh, development revolutions, countries that, that were often leaders in the, um, in the Green Revolution in the 60s and 70s, like India, um, countries that have become, that have moved from being food insecure, hungry, to being uh, major agricultural exporters like Brazil, countries that are a bit further along the development path than some of their neighbors like South Africa. Um, and we're uh, looking at ways to work with them uh, to promote agricultural development and improve nutrition in countries uh, um, uh, nearby. 
Um, so we're working with Brazil and Haiti and Honduras. We've also done some important work with them in Mozambique, where it's a Portuguese-speaking country like Brazil, so there's a, a connection there. Um, we're, we're also uh, working on, on policy change. You know, I mentioned uh, in the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition that one of the most important things uh, in, in spurring economic development is getting the policy environment right, making, uh, getting rid of um, uh, burdensome regulations that block investment into a sector, um, uh, uh, making sure the right regulations exist to take advantage of, of, of uh, technologies or, or um, investment opportunities uh, and so on. Um, so getting the policy environment right is something that the State Department works hard on. And we're also uh, key in the, we play a key role in the relations with the international organizations like the Food and Agriculture Organization or the World Food Program that are so crucial to the fight against hunger. We also work very closely with civil society. Um, the, uh, and, and so uh, our new Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry, was at a, a, a I guess it's a, a competitor uh, institution uh, just a, a month and a half ago. Um, where he highlighted the, the role of food security in our foreign policy and uh, the critical role that addressing food security plays in breaking that cycle of poverty and improving people's livelihoods for the long term. President Obama has also featured the fight against uh, poverty and hunger in uh, both of his uh, um, initial, in his, in his first inaugural address. He touched on it in the second inaugural and most recently in, in the State of the Union. And here we get to um, part of the reason why the, the global food security work, why we're doing it at the State Department, not just at our Agency for International Development. Because it is something that matters um, not just as, a, as something that we ought to do because it's morally right, although it is, um, but it's also something that we do because uh, it makes a difference for uh, America's long-term interests. Um, the the um, uh, you know, the, the bulk of economic growth in the world today is going to happen in today's developing countries. Those are our future trading partners, our future markets. Um, so making sure that those are healthy, thriving, prosperous economies is crit critical to U.S. economic interests. And it's certainly critical to our national security interests because hungry people are, are more likely to be dissatisfied, maybe blame it on their government, maybe lead to um, unrest and instability, whereas people who are in, um, part of a healthy, growing community, a healthy, thriving eco economy where, where they see a future for themselves, are more likely to be um, uh, to contribute to stable societies, um, which are the kinds of neighbors that we want. And so um, the fight against hunger and, and uh, undernutrition, um, you know, and it's, it's a fight that we can win if we try, um, and it's a fight that we, we need to win because it is the right thing to do, it's morally right, it's economically smart, and it makes sense for our national security. So with that, let me uh, close here. Thank you for your attention, and I guess we have, Paula, a few minutes for questions, and do you want us to both just sit down yep. here? Yep, thanks. Thank you so much. So do we have any questions for either of our speakers? My question is about um, eating in schools, specifically related to elementary schools. How do you exactly address situations where kids don't want to eat the healthier foods? Like, I remember my high school when we had like the nutritional campaigns, and it's great to put up like the colorful posters and oh, this is more nutritious, and it lists all the statistics on the side. But even as a high school student, I still wanted the chicken fingers. So how do you like <laughs> plan on addressing like little kids who want the chicken fingers and the fried foods? Right, yeah, and don't forget the tater tots too. They're uh, yeah, they're all the very popular. And the ramen. That's what I, and I, yeah, that's right. And the ramen is so. <laughs> so I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, um, I, I got to visit a, a very innovative uh, ship, the Teddy Roosevelt, the big aircraft carrier, when I was still the director of naval education and training. And the, and the senior chief, who was a culinary specialist, was very proud of her her, uh, her line, and she had beautiful broiled white fish and bro steamed broccoli and you know, very grilled vegetables and things like that. And there was plenty of it. You could have as much as you want. And the reason you could, because there was also a line where you get cheeseburgers and French fries and onion rings. And so I walked out onto the mess decks, and sure enough, I was the 18-year-old sailors were having triple cheeseburgers and, and onion rings because they had a choice. So I mean, I, I, I don't want to tell you that, that you can't make those other uh, foods uh, 
very interesting to kids. And I think if we start thinking of the, the lunchroom as a classroom and where there's actually a teaching going on, uh, I, I think that they have found that you can, maybe not everybody's gonna like broccoli, okay, got that, but maybe there, may, there is something else that they do. Maybe they do like the green beans, and if it's presented, number one, in a, in a healthy manner, it's not you know, cooked the way that we do it in the South with lots of grease or something like that, uh, and it, it is actually healthy, you can teach it. Uh, I've forgotten, and, and Mike, Mike Jane may have this, uh, there's a certain number of times you have to eat something before you said, oh, I like the first, if you, if you stop at the first time, I don't like broccoli, and you stop there, you won't ever like broccoli, but if you actually get a chance to be encouraged to try it a few times, and you learn it as a child, that, that's where the, the learning goes on. So, I mean, uh, you have to have choice, uh, but you have to have those opportunities. And right now, I think we're kind of defaulting to the chicken fingers. Um, yes. Uh, I, do you have a mic there? Yeah. Do you want to pass it back? And then there's another question further back. You can go first, and then... Um. Has Feed the Future um, made a stance on GMOs, and how are they addressing the issues of uh, kind of alternative forms of increasing quantity of food that might inevitably have some sort of environmental impact? Right, so uh, two halves to that question. So first of all, on, on, on GMOs, uh, um, to, which to make sure everyone's on the same page, although you've probably covered it in the, in the course already, is uh, genetically modified organisms or genetically engineered crops. Um, uh, it, is, it is a mainstay of American agriculture. So uh, you, know, you go into your local supermarket and most of the food you're buying um, uh, um, involves um, genetically engineered uh, um, crops, especially if it involves corn uh, or soy. Um, and so we know that for the US, it's led to significant increases in agricultural productivity. It's part of the, the agricultural technology toolkit. It's one of the technologies that's available for improving agricultural productivity. And, uh, and, and so we, we um, encourage countries to look at that option as one of the options uh, available to them. And uh, we also help countries uh, that are interested in that option uh, to develop the kinds of regulatory regimes that are needed to, to uh, introduce genetically engineered crops safely and, and, and sensibly. Um, and so that is a part of our, uh, our assistance programs. Um, but we, it's not something we you know, force on countries or anything like that. Um, and and, uh, um, and so, so we can talk more about that if there are follow-up questions, um, but uh, it is something that uh, we're, we're comfortable with and comfortable uh, uh, recommending as one of, the, one of the tools for improving productivity. Um, on uh, environment, and by the way, one of the reasons is for environmental impact reasons. Um, because if uh, you can um, introduce crops that are improved varieties, um, and most of the improved varieties that end up being um, introduced through Feed the Future are um, uh, not genetically engineered uh, varieties, they're conventionally bred improved varieties. Um, uh, if you have an improved variety, it may use less water because it's drought tolerant. It may use less pesticide because it's pest uh, resistant. Um, and, and so on, so that the, it, it, can, it can actually have environmental benefits um, to introduce improved varieties. Um, more broadly, um, uh, um, uh, we, we do look at sustainability of agriculture as part of the effort, because uh, uh, many of the regions where we're working are suffering from severe environmental pressures. Uh, you know, I mentioned before, droughts. Um, Ethiopia and Kenya uh, in the Horn of Africa are two of the, the, the leading recipients of Feed the Future assistance, um, and they just went through the, the, the worst drought in 60 years, uh, um, just a couple of years ago. Um, and so we concentrate our research funding for Feed the Future on um, uh, essentially climate tolerant cropping systems. Uh, so drought tolerant or flood tolerant or salt tolerant as the, as the needs uh, may be. Um, we also uh, introduce conservation agriculture techniques such as no-till agriculture, um, which uh, um, reduce the environmental impacts of uh, agricultural production. Um, we also introduce techniques for agroforestry, which means that people living in forested areas can grow crops without having to cut down the forest. They, um, it reduces the, the uh, prevalence of deforestation. So it is uh, an important part of our work. Thanks for the Thank question. You.
Okay, first off, I just want to say, that is a magnificent tie, sir. That is amazing. Um, but my question's for the Admiral. Um, obviously, bringing nutrition... You like my tie, too? Or is this <laughs> it's it's nice. with the flag on it. So. Um, obviously, bringing nutrition into the classroom is a great idea, and bringing PE back to school is awesome. But it seems to me that's only half the problem. The other half is you have these large private companies, such as Sodexo, which are bringing this processed food in, and they're bringing it in because it's cheaper. I'm just curious, how would you go after these companies, which, in my opinion, are largely responsible for this obesity epidemic? You know, there, there are lots, uh, and I would want to say that schools are the only place that we need to do that. There needs to be comprehensive approaches. And the fact of the matter is there are several things. Obviously, uh, the amount of sugar in our in a diet has gone up significantly. The portion of, of, uh, of foods that we get in, in various restaurants, the fact that we eat uh, more of our meals in restaurants now. All of this plays a, a part in it. Um, and so we have, to, we have to address those things as well. The, uh, I have to tell you something else, and I would, I would tell you, we, we probably all think we have the answer uh, to this. There's no, there's no silver bullet. There's interesting research, it, it may be kind of on the edge right now, of uh, something called the adenovirus 36. That, that seems to have gained prevalence about the same time that you saw that epidemic taking off and may be affecting as much as 20 to 30 percent of our, our population. And, and one of the interesting things about it is you're seeing this not only in areas like America, you're also seeing it in some areas where there's a, there's a food, there are food shortages, so people are actually gaining weight and they don't actually have as much in that country as they, they need to. So we need to, to, number one, remain open. Uh, number two, we do need to look at things like how do we as a society eat more healthily? The reason the mission readiness concentrates on the, on the schools is it's a longitudinal problem. You're not going to fix it next year. And for us, if we really want to make an impact, you have to start early. So the schools, the fact that 50% of those calories are taken in schools seems to be a major impact area. But I wouldn't say that that needs to be the exclusive area by any means. You're exactly right. Question here. Yeah. We can repeat, we can, we can yeah. repeat the question. Um, it's just kind of a more basic question about Feed the Future and how it's actually implemented in developing countries. So just kind of how does it work at an elementary level? Like, do you have a group of... Um, representatives from the State Department going into Guatemala, Nicaragua, Haiti, meeting with local communities, like how does it actually work? So um, uh, first of all, um, uh, USAID, the US Agency for International Development is the lead agency for Feed the Future. Um, and so in, in uh, uh, really all of the 19 countries where we're concentrating our efforts, it's the AID mission, the Agency for International Development team in that country that's uh, leading the charge. Um, and, uh, but uh, they are supported by, um, certainly, well, they're overseen by the ambassador who, who often comes from the State Department in, in most of these countries, um, uh, who can also help with some of the policy changes where we, we, we want to go talk to the Minister of Agriculture or the Minister of Finance and urge um, or provide assistance in helping them figure out a way to change some of the tax code or change export rules or import rules to help either improve ability to import foodstuffs or improve the ability to export agricultural production um, and so on. So this is the policy piece where several agencies may get involved. The, the development experts from AID and in some countries we also have the Millennium Challenge Corporation which has development experts posted in the field. Um, they will work with the host government and again in the, in the case of, of all of the governments where we're working the governments either had when we arrived or now have, uh, as a result of our assistance and their own efforts, a national agricultural development strategy um, so that we know what their priorities are. They want to work on, in one country, they might want to work on, on uh, improving rice production um, and secondarily improving uh, uh, poultry production and fisheries um, and, uh, and then also horticulture for vegetables and fruits. Um, and they identify which kinds of fruits and vegetables they're going after. We then come in and line up our work behind their priorities. And we might come in with um, uh, assistance that uh, um, brings in 
uh, experts on improving rice production uh, who know about the, the best improved varieties globally and the best improved varieties that work in that particular region. So if we're working in Cambodia and someone's come up with a, an improved rice variety that's been uh, pioneered in Vietnam, they'll know about it. They can help introduce it into, into Vietnam, uh, into, into Cambodia. Um, we also uh, um, uh, can help uh, um, generate partnerships. So for example, um, in uh, Ethiopia, uh, USAID has worked with the government of Ethiopia with PepsiCo, um, which you may know is behind Sabra hummus that, that you see in the, in the shops around here. Um, uh, and, and so that's a company that actually knows something, something about chickpeas. And uh, the World Food Program, which is the UN agency that is on the front lines delivering food to refugee camps or other people in acute need. So uh, with this um, four-way partnership, um, we're helping uh, now 13,000 um, Ethiopian chickpea farmers to improve chickpea productivity, to improve their production. Um, that will help them earn more, certainly. Um, it will also, over time, help them uh, become, uh, help, it, it, Pepsi, what PepsiCo is providing is also a market because they will be able to buy the production from these farmers for regional products that PepsiCo's marketing in that part of the world made from chickpeas, um, and potentially over time uh, feeding those chickpeas into their global supply chain. Then the World Food Program in this partnership um, is uh, working with all of these partners to develop a chickpea-based paste that's nutritionally dense, um, has all the micronutrients that, 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 that a healthy uh, diet needs, um, that can be used in acute uh, situations like refugee camps. And so those, so you, now you have the phenomenon of Ethiopian farmers helping to produce the, the, um, the, 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 the supplemental foods that are needed for refugee camps, potentially next time there's a, a drought in other parts of Ethiopia or the Horn of Africa. So you've got multiple dimensions to the, the, the challenge. Um, and the US, can, the US government can help drive those kinds of partnerships that, that provide this transformational uh, change opportunity. Thanks. Um, I'd like to elaborate on the GMO question real quick. Um, to what extent are big agribusinesses, Monsanto, Dow, Bayer, Cargill, et cetera, playing a role in country, on the ground, with USAID? And uh, would you be willing to elaborate on the uh, regulation advising you guys provide um, to countries regarding GMOs? Sure. Uh, so. Um, the, so, so, so we, we do end up working with uh, a variety of companies, and if we're working on, on, on agricultural development, some of those companies are agribusinesses and some of them are big. So we do work with some of those companies. Um, uh, and similarly, if we're looking uh, at uh, research, um, developing technological breakthroughs, um, a lot of the, so uh, what you find in, in research and development in general uh, throughout the, the economy and throughout not just the U.S. economy but economies around the world is the public sector is often good at, at funding uh, the basic research, but when you want to apply it to real world problems, it's, uh, it's increasingly as you work along that spectrum towards real world applications, um, you find that the private sector is often uh, the, the research and development leader. Um, and so it, it's to our benefit in terms of our objectives um, to work with private sector partners on the research end as well. That often happens in the context of university partnerships where the U.S. funds a research partnership at a university. They're now called innovation labs in this development space, um, uh, which may also partner with private sector firms, including some of the agribusinesses uh, that, are, that are science leaders like Dow or, or, or um, DuPont. Um, and, 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 and so, so we do work with those companies in various ways. Um, but again, we work with companies, I mentioned PepsiCo, but I could have mentioned a, a, a small company um, like uh, Lausanne Farms in, in Mozambique, which is a Mozambican company that's introducing improved crop varieties, such as uh, um, orange flesh sweet potatoes, which have uh, more uh, vitamin A precursors, so that uh, it helps uh, reduce night blindness and improve nutrition for people who eat them. Um, and a variety of other improved crop varieties. So this was a, a company started locally, started small, is now midish size, but it's Mozambican. So we work with companies of all sizes and scales. Um, 
and in terms of uh, GMO advisory uh, um, assistance, what we do is we, we help countries uh, that want to um, uh, introduce genetically engineered crops into their agricultural systems um, develop the regulatory regimes that are needed to do that safely. And what that means is um, you need to be able to um, uh, do risk assessments, do, do uh, um, uh, 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 the, the kinds of studies of proposed uh, um, crop varieties that someone wants to introduce and, and uh, make assessments of, of whether it's safe and, and, and appropriate uh, to, to introduce that variety into, into, your, into your country. That's what regulators do. So we help countries develop um, sound regulatory systems. I hope that answers the question. I thought it was fascinating how you're both working on helping people eat well, but it's such a... Completely different end of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. And that it started off actually in the US with the, with the same problem, with mm -hmm. malnutrition, and yet now we've gone to... It, it is it is a uh, quite quite a difference in the approach, and of course, there's it's not like there's not uh, food insecurity in the United States either. And uh, somebody over here mentioned something about food deserts. Uh, it's it's still a, sig a significant problem, um, but but by and large, it goes uh, more toward the other thing: is that we just we we like sugar, we like lots of food, uh, and uh, we we get we get. You know, rewards, the brain is set up to have a reward system for those types of food. Uh, we, we need to be able to do, not just individual, and there's a lot of emphasis on, well, you ought to take individual responsibility. The fact of the matter is, is that there's, there's a lot that's pumped at us as a society, and it's going to take societal action to do something about it. Uh, so I think that's Did a great note, to, Oh, yes. No, oh, no, I was okay. just going to say that, uh, you know, we are seeing in developing countries uh, um, a, a growing number of people facing the dual burden of undernutrition yeah. and uh, obesity. Um, and part of that is because sometimes the cheapest way to fill your belly is not the most nutritious way. You know, you fill right. up, uh, you, you, I'm sure a few of you have done this uh, when you're hungry, you know, you, you load up a plate of pasta and, and you've got your carbs, but you don't have the, the complete food basket there. Um, and so uh, we are trying to confront this, this dual burden, but for the populations that we're focused on, it's still really a problem of undernutrition more so than overnutrition. Do we have time for that clip that, that oh. we have? Yeah, it's about, a one, it's about a one-minute clip. This is just fun. <laughs> so, just for a can, bit can we play it? Yeah. Vision, with the increasing threat of terror attacks, we need a strong and capable military, which is why I was alarmed by this recent report by Mission Readiness, a nonprofit group of retired military leaders. A group of retired military officers said pizza. Fries, corn dogs, nachos that are served in the lunchroom have made 27% of young Americans too fat to fight. We, the members of Mission Readiness, believe that child obesity, this issue is so serious that it has become a threat to our national security. Evidently, kids, the Army doesn't really want you to be all that you can be. It's the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. This is rather disturbing. A government panel made up of all retired military personnel says that the school lunches are a threat to our national security because they make our kids too fat to serve the country. It's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> Remember the old days when the Army wanted the best and the brightest? Now they're stuck with the biggest and the widest. That's basically the thing. Fat kids coming in there. According to a new report that just came out, about 75% of the country's young people are ineligible for military service because they are poorly educated, overweight, or have drug or criminal issues. Yeah. Now, on the bright side, this makes them perfectly eligible for reality shows. Yeah? <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> and zip, and... <laughs> Much. You're both wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, both of you.